and even more. Uh, and there's also a kind of like a side benefit to this, uh, the putting more and more people in jail, and in fact under harsher and harsher conditions, uh, has an, has a, is a technique of social control for everybody else. I mean, when you're, if you're, you know, if one, someday down the road you decide to run a dictatorship uh, and you want to really harm people, it's kind of like Hitler Germany or something, you know, you, you, you know that you're going to carry out policies that are going to cause people a lot of harm. Uh, you've got to control them somehow. And there aren't many ways to do it. Everyone hits on the same ways. Uh, what you do is engender fear and hatred and you know, make them hate the guy who looks a little different or whatever it may be. Uh, and uh, then you punish those bad guys because they're really awful and you punish them really hard and so on. And that makes people even more frightened. Uh, you can just see that happening right around you. And uh, uh, building up the perception of crime, crime has a like a what they call in literary theory a subtext. You're supposed to understand criminal has the word, little word black in front of it, just like welfare mother, you know, black, rich black, welfare mother. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and criminal means, you know, that black guy is coming after you. So uh, uh, what you want to do is, uh, uh, this has the dual effect of getting rid of a superfluous population, basically unskilled workers, you know, close race, class correlation. Uh, and uh, uh, also demonizing them so everybody else is scared and frightened and they'll be willing to accept what's happening to them too and not look at where the source is. Uh, so that part of the, uh, the, the drug wars basically for this has almost nothing to do with drugs but it has plenty to do with criminalizing an unwanted population and scaring everybody else. And, and so does the harshening of uh, prison conditions which is really, it's, uh, the United States is off the map on this one in violation of international conventions constantly condemned in human rights forums and getting much worse. Uh, the reinstitution of chain gangs uh, was, of course, bitterly condemned, but, you know, that's that bad South, Alabama. Well, it's now in Illinois. The state senate of Illinois last a week or two ago uh, legislated chain gangs, not for violent criminals, incidentally, uh, for people who are found with drugs or, you know, rob the store or something like that. Uh, the Chicago Press pointed out that this uh, carries uh, this kind of reminiscent of slavery, uh, but the legislator and the senator, state senator who put it through said that this is just another aspect of what he called tough love, and then he explained that some people work better under humiliation, uh, so it's really good to restore elements of slavery, and again, the subtext is everybody else gets scared. You know, if those guys have to walk around like slaves in chains, we're, we must be in real danger, so therefore we'll accept what's happening to us. That's the logic. Uh, so prisons are going up, uh, and, uh, uh, it's, uh, and that has a lot of side benefits, uh, apart from just getting rid of the superfluous population. It is a source of cheap labor, so prison labor is going way up. Uh, cheap labor, you don't have to worry about unions, no benefits, they don't get out of line. Uh, for, and that also naturally undercuts wages elsewhere. So when, just like forcing welfare mothers to work, you know, raising children isn't work as anybody knows who's had children. Uh, so you have to drive them to work, kind of like people who go to, you know, Fidelity Investment to figure out scams about how to deal with the security market, you really want these people to work. But since there's no jobs for them, they're going to work at low paid or sub publicly subsidized wages which will undercut other wages. And the same with uh, uh, prison labor. Uh, all, uh, in fact, the scale of prison construction, uh, which is a kind of Keynesian stimulus to the economy anyway, but its scale has become so enormous that even high tech industry, you know, the guys who are usually just ripping off the Pentagon system, they're beginning to look at it, figuring out, uh, con re recognizing that uh, high tech surveillance devices and so on may be another way to sort of get the transfer of public funds to make sure that uh, high-tech industry keeps moving. It's reached, it's not the scale of the Pentagon, but it's going up. Uh, well, that's one aspect of what's called reducing government, uh, modifying government to be more precise. Uh, another aspect of it is what's called devolution, you know, reducing, moving governmental power from the federal to the state level. Uh, and that has a kind of a rationale which you hear all over the time, place. For example, there was an op-ed a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times by uh, John Kogan, who's Hoover Institute at Stanford, uh, who pointed out what he called a philosophical issue that divides the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, the philosophical issue is that the Democrats believe in big government and entitlement, 
and the Republicans believe in getting power down closer to the people, uh, to the states, because they're kind of populist types. Well, uh, it takes about maybe three seconds thought uh, to recognize, to realize that moving power down to the states uh, in funding and so on is just moving it away from the people. Uh, for perfectly elementary reason, there's a hidden part of the system, of the power system, that you're not supposed to know about or think about, and that's private power. And now it takes a big corporation like, say, General Electric or Microsoft to sort of pressure the federal government, but even middle-sized guys have no problems with state governments. They can control them quite easily. And in case anyone was too dull to figure this out by themselves, uh, the same day as Kogan's op-ed in the New York Times, which is a typical one, uh, the, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal about Massachusetts, uh, which had a headline that read, uh, what fidelity investment wants, it usually gets. Okay. And then the story went on to say that Fidelity Investment, the biggest investment firm in Massachusetts, uh, wanted even more uh, subsidy and support from the state government that it already gets. And it was threatening if it didn't, it would move over the border to Rhode Island, where it just owns the place. Uh, so therefore, the uh, passionately libertarian governor quickly rearranged you know, tax subsidies and one thing or another so that Fidelity got what it wanted. Well, Fidelity couldn't have done that with the federal government. Couldn't have said, you know, you give us even more, we're going to move to Switzerland or something. I mean, other guys can do it maybe, but not Fidelity. Uh, Raytheon, which is the biggest manufacturing uh, producer, did the same thing. Raytheon, uh, incidentally, Fidelity, is not, it's not that Fidelity is poor. They just announced record, record profits a couple of days ago. Uh, same with Raytheon, just announced record profits, but you know, having big problems. Uh, so they wanted even a bigger tax subsidy and uh, direct subsidy and tax write-offs, which just means transfer of taxes to, uh, from the state of Massachusetts. And they threatened if they didn't get them, they were going to go to Tennessee. So of course they got them. The legislature passed a special uh, law giving what they call defense industry special extra subsidies. Uh, Notice that Raytheon is publicly subsidized in the first place. That's where its money comes from. But now it has to be an additionally subsidized so that its uh, profits will be even higher than the record profits it just made. Same with Fidelity. Uh, and that's the kind of game anybody can, you know, even, even way down to much smaller businesses can play with states. And the consequences of devolution are quite straightforward. Uh, it means that uh, any funding that goes to, say, block grants that go to the states, uh, you can be reasonably confident that they'll end up in the deep pockets of rich people, not uh, you know, in, the, uh, in the hands of uh, hungry children or uh, poor mothers or anything like that. Uh, that's how you get power down to the people. Okay, that's devolution. Uh, in fact, quite generally, when you look at it, what's called government cutting uh, is, uh, is more or less cost transfer. It's almost never reduction. Sometimes it's increase. So let's take what's called take health reform. Reform is a word you always ought to watch out for. You know, like when Mao called, started the Cultural Revolution, it wasn't called a reform. You know? Reform is a change that you're supposed to like. Okay? Uh, and watch, so as soon as you hear the word reform, you kind of reach for your wallet and see who's lifting it. Uh, anyhow, the, there are things called health reforms. Uh, and the health reforms uh, are supposed to you know, cut government costs. Well, they do cut one kind of cost, but of course they raise another kind of cost. Uh, there's a very respectable outfit called the uh, National Bipartisan Leadership Council, uh, headed by uh, two ex-presidents, Ford and Carter. Uh, and it just did a study of the cost transfer effects of the planned health reforms. Uh, it concluded that they would add about $10 billion a year extra costs but those extra costs will come from wages and higher premiums, okay, which means it's a highly regressive tax on the poor. Highly regressive tax, you know, if it comes from wages and premiums, of course. And that's $10 billion a year. They also estimated that it'll increase the number of uninsured by 15 to 20 percent. Up by This is by the year 2002, so up to about 54 million by the year 2002. Well, that's a cost, a uh, big cost, an unmeasurable cost. Uh, so, and, and, the, and so you find all the way across the board, and furthermore, it's no big secret. So like the Wall Street Journal had a headline which pointed out that 
when the reforms were you know, moving through Congress, it said rich gain, poor lose, trade-offs for the middle class, okay? uh, which is right. That's exactly what the reforms are intended to do. You have to remember my middle class, they mean the people right below the very rich. So they don't mean the median. You know, they're not talking about people with 30,000 a year income. Uh, they mean every, you know, so what it really means is great for the rich, super rich, trade-offs for those, the near rich, uh, tough business, tough love for everybody else, which is most everyone. Uh, when you close public hospitals and that sort of thing, you know exactly who's going to suffer. Uh, well, let's go to uh, what are called, take say New York, which it has two, a conservative governor and a conservative uh, uh, mayor. And they're carrying out very